Well, hello, and welcome to English class with me, Mr. DeClerc. All right, so got some of that silliness out of the way. We are going to be looking at Blues Ain't No Mockingbird today. You have already read it. I hope you enjoyed it. I really, really enjoy this story. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, in order to do justice to the story, I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between our document here and a slideshow to hopefully better walk you through. So you have a copy of this already, so hopefully you are going to be able to track along with me, even if I am not perfectly able to keep up with it. So um, I'm also going to go ahead and set my alarm now that I'm thinking about it, so that way... If I go a little too long, I'll have kind of a reminder. So I'm going to set that. And uh, all right. So blues ain't no mocking. Blah, 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 blues ain't no mockingbird. And the first thing I notice right off the bat is the grammar structure of it. Blues ain't no mocking bird. One of the things I notice here is this idea of uh, of dialect. Blues ain't no mockingbird, and ain't would not be proper grammar. We would say blues are not a mockingbird or something like that. I don't know. The grammar fixing it would get very confusing, but I love the title. Blues ain't no mockingbird, meaning blues is not a mockingbird. Anyway, we're going to talk about dialect as we get started here in the beginning. But what I noticed in particular is this idea of abbreviations or lack thereof. Mockingbird. Now, normally... If we have, I am going to the store, going, finalizing with the G there. And if we drop the G, usually we use that apostrophe to point out to the reader, hey, I dropped the G. And if we don't use the apostrophes, as in this last one, it looks to us to be improper writing, perhaps sloppy writing or, you know, just lack of proofreading or whatever. And as we look through this, we are going to immediately notice that the author does not use these apostrophes. Well, guess what? First of all, you have to think, did the author make a mistake? Is the author a fool? Did the publisher and the printer and the proofreader, did none of these people catch these mistakes? And of course, they notice that they're not proper. This is an intentional choice. And when someone is choosing something intentionally, your job as the reader is to ask, gee, why did they do this intentionally? And it's because of this idea of dialect. Let's look at this first paragraph. The puddle had frozen over and me and Kathy went stomping in it. The twins from next door, Tyrone and Terry, were swinging so high out of sight we forgot we were waiting our turn on the tire. Kathy jumped up and came down hard on her heels and started tap dancing. So every one of these verbs that should end in the G, or if you drop the G, should end in the apostrophe, none of them do that. And I think it's because we're getting this idea of sort of the down-home country dialect. Uh, I like to read this in my mind. The puddle of frozen over. Me and Kathy went stomping in it. The twins from next door, Tyrone and Terry, were swinging so high out of sight. We forgot we were waiting our turn on the tire. It's this kind of easy flowing, smooth language. It's this dialect um, that I don't think we hear a lot of here in California. I think this is going to be more of a Southern kind of dialect and, and Google doesn't like the incorrect spelling. <laughs> so I'm trying to fix that. All right, uh, so the first thing I noticed there is the abbreviations and the dialect, and I can hear our narrator speaking to me. She is not writing a story. She is not punctuating it perfectly. She's just talking. She's just talking to us, you know? All right. Um, so next thing I notice in this opening paragraph is this idea of imagery and using words to create a visual image in my mind. So there's a tiny little bit of frozen water Okay? And they jump on it and they crack the frozen water. And so we're told it looks kind of like a spider web, but a spider web done with a spider with mental problems. So it's kind of funny. It's kind of cute. And I get a really clear picture of both what the ice is going to look like 
And I also get a sense for who these kids are and a little bit for who our narrator and her, her family and friends are. All right. The next thing here that I want to talk about is the ladle. And I know we're only on the first page, but it's super important to start off right. So uh, Granny is on the back porch making the cakes drunk. And again, I love that phrase, making the cakes drunk. I think that helps lend itself to the idea of dialect here, which means she's using the ladle and pouring the rum onto these cakes. Making them drunk means adding that alcohol to the cake. All right. Now look at this sentence because it's a complex sentence with lots of things going on here. The old ladle dripping rum into the Christmas tins like it used to drip maple syrup into the pails when we lived in the Judson Woods, like it poured cider into the vats when we were on the Cooper Place, like it used to scoop buttermilk and soft cheese when we lived at the dairy. Follow the life journey of this ladle scooping the rum onto the Christmas tins right now. It used to do maple syrup when they lived on the Judson Woods. So right now, Judson Woods. Pouring cider into the vats on the Cooper Place. Scooping buttermilk when we lived at the dairy. What do we know based on this sentence? Yeah, it's a big full sentence and you're thinking, who cares about the ladle? The ladle is the story of this family, and the story of this family is that they have moved at least four times. Now, maybe that's not that many times to you. Uh, it could be that it's not that big of a deal, but it kind of strikes me as the sense of a lot of movement, the way this sentence is written. This family has been displaced many times. We don't know why they've moved so many times, but because of what the label, ladle has done, we can learn that this family has moved around a lot. All right. Now we're getting a little bit more into the weeds here. And we get this idea of uh, the cameraman walking up. So a couple of things we notice the characters always pay attention to who the characters are. And Kathy is one of them. Pay attention to how Kathy is described a whole bunch throughout the story. That boy don't never have anything original to say. Say Kathy grown up. So just pay attention to that, and we'll watch Kathy throughout this story. Okay, and then again, we pay attention when we introduce when we are introduced to characters. So we have the man with the camera. So pay attention to Kathy, and pay attention to the man with the camera, and how these terms grow. All right, I know, hitting a lot of stuff here real quick. So now we get the cam, the man with the camera, and he's speaking. We thought we'd get a shot or two of the house and everything in that. A little dash tells us he was interrupted. He was cut off. His sentence is broken and stopped. So you got to think. You got to listen. As you read, you have to hear their words. We thought we'd get a shot of the house and everything. And then, good morning. Granny cut him off. Smile that smile. She's smiling that smile. Well, what's the smile? It's a knowing smile. It's a smile that says, you think you can just walk up and start talking to me and not introduce yourself? or what you're doing here? I don't think so, Buster, right? Good morning, she says, politely, but also not politely. Good morning, he said, his head down the way Bingo does. Well, do you have a dog? Have you ever yelled at your dog, right? Dog's head goes, hmm, hmm, hmm. So this guy, he gets shamed. Granny puts him in his place. He's just talking, she goes, good morning. He goes, oh. Okay. Again, the imagery, I can imagine this man and how he's reacting and behaving. I like how Granny kind of cuts him off and puts him in his place. And then the same thing again. It says, did you say Granny with her eyebrows? Do you think her eyebrows are actually talking? No, of course not. She's using her facial expression to communicate her disinterest and disgust in who this guy is. Did you? Uh, nice things, the man said. All right. And she's uh, kind of embarrassing him a little bit. And then she continues and says, I don't know about the, the thing, the it and the stuff. Still talking with her eyebrows, which means she's still looking at him. She's got maybe one eyebrow way up high and one eyebrow way down low, like, mm-hmm, buster, right? Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, let's pay attention to the man. It was the man with the camera, and now it's the man and buzzing his camera, so pay attention, follow along with who these people are. 
Because now look, as we turn the page, look what happens. Now it's not the man with the camera. Now it's camera man. It's as if the way he is identified becomes his proper name. We don't know his name yet. We know Granny's name. She's Granny. Cameraman is the man with the camera, and that's just become his entire identity. In fact, when I read this, I don't even think of a head. I always just think of like a camera on shoulders, which I think is kind of funny. All right. And then this other guy walks up, and we go from cameraman to uh, this guy who's smiling. And he's smiling up a storm, smiling man. So two men, cameraman and smiling man, are walking up into Granny's yard, and they're filming. Okay? All right. Uh, and then we get some part of the conflict here, just a little bit. We're filming for the county, see? Part of the food stamp campaign. You know about the food stamps? Now, we don't actually use stamps anymore. <clears throat> they used to literally be stamps. Now you get like uh, EBT cards. Uh, we might call it welfare. We might still call it food stamps, but um, the idea is this. There's a typo. Sorry about that. Okay. It's a, it's a governmental support. Okay. Uh, counties and states and the federal government will give money to those people who are poor in the form of stamps that you can then take into the grocery store and redeem for food and necessary supplies. Okay. So it's a form of it's a form of the government giving you money, which basically then shows that you are poor. So think about it. Here's this guy, a stranger, walking up into their property, videotaping their yard and their home and their kids, doesn't introduce himself, does not say hello. And he says, we're making a film about poor people. You want to be in our movie about poor people? Because you look poor. That's kind of the implication. And he goes on and says, I see you grow your own vegetables. If more folks did that, there'd be no need. Again, look at this dash, the cutoff. He doesn't finish his sentence, which means Granny is looking at him like, I don't think so. So these guys walk into their yard basically saying, we're making a f movie for poor people. You look poor. Look! Poor people making their own vegetables. Oh, good for you. Can we teach other poor people to grow their own vegetables? Yeah. It's insulting, you guys. It would be so insulting to have someone walk up and do that to you and your family. Anyway. Now, we're getting to this section on page four to a story within the story. Okay? These guys have kind of walked away now, so it's now Granny and the kids... And Granny always got something to say. She teaches steady with no let up. Granny is now going to tell a story with a purpose. And we know she has a purpose because Granny teaches steady with no let up. Right? The story tells us she has a reason for this. Remember that when we get to the end of the story. <clears throat> so the story is basically this. Granny saw this guy standing on a bridge one time. And the guy's about to jump. And people are saying, no, don't jump. No, don't jump. And there is this person, and try and listen to how this sounds. So here he comes. This person with a camera taking pictures of the man and the minister and the woman. Taking pictures of the man and his misery about to jump because life's so bad. And people have been messing with him so bad. This person taking up the whole roll of film practically, but saving a few, of course. Of course said Kathy. And me standing there, me, the narrator, who we never actually hear her name. I always assume it's a her, but it could be a he. But I like to imagine it as a little girl. Me standing there wondering how Kathy knows it's of course when I don't. And then the boys say, did he jump? And then Granny just stares at them till their faces swallow up their eager because the boys, they're like, did he jump? Did he splat? And she just looks at them. And they're, these like, mm -hmm. And their faces swallow up the eager, which is such a great way of writing. I love it. But then Granny goes inside. So wait a second. If Granny teaches steady with no let up, 
then she teaches with a reason. And then we get down here. She doesn't finish the story. She just goes inside. So critical readers, what the heck? If you continue reading, we don't finish the story. And in fact, we get on a whole different tangent. So now you have to figure out. Why is he saving a few, of course? Now, of course, the story is being written before, you know, you had your cell phones and you could take 10 million pictures. Um, we're talking about a roll of film, which generally had like 24 pictures on it. And so this camera person in this story here, it's a different camera person. Remember, video camera and then photo camera. This camera person in Granny's story, the story within the story, this photo person is saving a few. Why would he save a few? Well, if the person is about to jump, you get the action, him on the bridge, you get the minister, you get the girlfriend or the wife, and you get the other people watching. Maybe the cops over here. Why would you need to save a few shots? Well, because if that person jumps and splats, then you can take a couple pictures at the end. But Granny's story is not about the jumper, is it? And this is what we recognize as critical readers. It's not about the jumper. Who's the story about? It's about the camera person taking pictures of this person in his worst moment of his life. He wants to kill himself and someone comes up and takes pictures of it. Hold that thought in your mind. We'll come back to that. All right. Um... All right, and then down here we get this story within a story, right? And our narrator is so like kind of confused, like how come Kathy knows? Kathy's not really even a part of our family. We just kind of picked her up one time, and I love it because it's this, it's just the narrator, this child, just boop, oh this thought, oh boop this thought, and she's just saying what comes to her mind. It's cute, it's fun. I love the way it's written. Um, so. We get all these tangents, these side stories that if you really pick apart, you get all these gooey, yummy little morsels of story. So Kathy's just a third cousin we picked up last Thanksgiving. So it's this idea of like the family just kind of comes together. Kathy's not like an immediate blood relative, but that tells me whatever was going on in Kathy's life was such that she still needed a family. And Granny who's not even mama, right? It's granny, the narrator's grandmother. So where's mama? Where's Kathy's parents? Why are they moving around so much? Again, it tells me that this family is perhaps very poor and, and their circumstances are such that they have to move around. All right. Uh, then I told you we'd talk about Kathy. Say Kathy sound like a, sounding like granny teacher. Okay, and then down here we get Kathy actress. I didn't even ask. I could see Kathy Actress was very likely. It almost like become her name, like Cameraman, Smiling Man, Kathy Actress. Kathy becomes known, her name becomes known by the way she's behaving. Just fascinating. All right. Now, Granny, she's still doing what she's doing, and she's mumbling real low and holding her forehead like you want to fall off. Like her forehead's going to fall off and mess up the rum cakes. I love this dialect. The way it's written, the story is so beautiful. All right. No longer are they smiling man and cameraman. They are simply smiling and camera. Their names have been shortened. Almost like now it's their nickname. Right? So here are the two guys that the story started with. And they're walking up behind Granddaddy. We're meeting Granddaddy Kane for the first time. Okay. Uh, and granddaddy's got this chicken hawk. So he's got, he's wearing this oil skin, which is type of, uh, jacket. And he's got this chicken hawk and he's holding it in his hand cause he killed one of them. And he's coming over and he, the hammer and he nails it. He nails it to the barn door, which is amazing. And I love this sentence here, the hammer cracking through the eardrums. And one thing I've never quite understood Okay, and maybe this is a, a thing that someone from another geographical region would be able to explain to me. I don't know why the chicken hawk is so bad, except that maybe it's eating their chickens. But um, I don't know. It says the hammer cracking through the eardrums. I don't know if that's our narrator saying the loud sound, boom, boom, boom. 
or if he's literally hammering the bird through the bird's eardrums. Like he takes the nail and goes, pa, pa, pa. Either way, it's gross. The bird flapping and drooling, and the driveway becomes red, then brown, then black, as this blood just falls out of the bird. All right. And then we get a whole nother tangent. Critical readers, you might be confused, and that's okay. If you and your annotations wrote, I'm confused. I don't really get this. That's okay. It's okay to be confused. All right. Um, and then this other bird is flying. He's, they say he's come to claim his mate, said Kathy Fast. And look at this. I love this. This is a golden line. This is a sentence that just brings me great joy. The cameraman ducking and bending and running and falling, jiggling the camera and scared. It almost takes on a musical quality to me. And all of these verbs, it's so filled with action. And when you drop the G, it just flows like honey. The cameraman ducking and bending, running and falling, jiggling the camera and scared. It just flows smoothly. It's beautiful. I love it. It's just a good sentence. It's fun. I like reading it. And that's cool. Find a sentence you like reading. All right. And granddaddy, he just looks at these guys. And all he has to do is say, good day, gentlemen. And these guys, like, they don't know what to do. They're like, um, um, who is this guy? And he's standing there tall and silent like a king. And we get this whole other tangent of granddaddy being on the, the train. And not just a waiter, but the waiter. Again, like, it's his entire existence is who he is, the waiter. Right? All right, so it's just a tangent. But again, critical readers, when you get these tangents, you just get this warm, gooey part of the story that's just fun, just good. All right, not really important overall to our story, but it's just delightful to read. And then he wants you to hand the camera. And I could see Granddaddy standing there tall and big, and he takes the camera and just... He just like rips this camera in half, right? Granddaddy's other hand flies up a calabas like a like a pumpkin, and he just like like rips this thing half. And look at Granddaddy's response: "You standing in the Mrs. Flower Bed. This is our own place." I bet you didn't realize how important this sentence is. This is our own place. We'll come back to this in just a minute. Okay. So Granddaddy destroys their camera, and these guys. Now look, how are they described, right? Uh, let's see here. Actually, I skipped this part up here, but it's the tall man with no machine on his shoulder. I love it. The cameraman without the camera has lost his entire identity, and now he's just the tall man with no camera. All right. It's just good. All right, camera jumps forward. Oh, no, look what you did. You're ruining the film. Sorry, another typo. Um and Granddaddy says, you're standing in the Mrs. Flower Bed. This is our own place. And so these guys kind of just wander off trying to protect their film, but it's ruined. If you know anything about film, once it sees the sunlight before it's been processed, it's ruined. So their whole video, their whole movie has been completely ruined. And that's kind of the end of the story. So are you a little confused? You might be a little confused. Um, so let's see here. Granny, uh, Granddad walks into the house and Granny goes back to work and life returns to normal for them. So you have to ask, if they are now acting normally, what was the thing that set off the abnormally, which if you look back at the very beginning, it was the cameraman and the smiling man coming in. So that's where we see the conflict. Granny doesn't want them there. She tells him to leave. She says, turn that machine off. Tell him, don't do that. And it takes till Grand, Granddaddy Kane destroys their camera to get these guys to leave. All right. Last couple little things. I love this. Kathy Dreamer. Again, look at Kathy and how she's described. Kathy Dreamer says, I'm going to tell a story someday about the proper use of a hammer. And that's kind of the last little bit here. And you have to wonder, well, what the heck's the proper use of, of a hammer then? You know a hammer for like hammering nails, right? 
But we never once in this whole story see anybody use a hammer to hammer nails. Instead, what do we see? We see Granddaddy use the hammer to bah, walk the, whack the hat hawk right out of the sky. I'm going to watch my language. But it's pretty awesome. It's like, he's a tough guy. He's amazing. He just takes his hammer and throws it and knocks the hawk right out of the sky while cameraman and smiler man are scared and they're running and this hawk is attacking. It's awesome. I love Grandy. So the proper use of the camera has nothing to do with how you would use a hammer. It has how, how granddaddy just wah, scares these guys. All right. So now let's talk. What's the big idea? What's the theme? What happens overall throughout this whole story? It's very simple. Cameraman and Smiling Man are making a video for the county about uh, food stamps. Okay? We know that they've moved all over the place. We know that they pick up Kathy from just some family members, and we don't know where mom and dad are. We just know where granny and granddaddy are. Right? So we can kind of put all these pieces together and assume that this is a rather poor family. In fact, I actually think I skipped the page um, about how, uh, yeah, page, uh, what was that, page five? I'm sorry, I skipped this. Um, people wouldn't pay her for things. Or Mr. Judson bringing us a box of old clothes and raggedy magazines. Mrs. Cooper coming in our kitchen and touching everything and seeing how clean it is. These people are insulting, basically saying, you're so poor, you would like whatever magazines I give you, even if they're old and falling apart. You're poor. Here are some gross old clothes. It doesn't matter. You're poor. Uh, touching the stuff in the kitchen. I didn't know poor people knew how to clean house. Look at you. I'm so impressed. It's patronizing. It's insulting. It's like the cameraman saying, you grow vegetables? If other poor people grew vegetables... The government wouldn't have to pay the money. It's patronizing. It's insulting. It's terrible. And so there's a couple of things here. I think the big one is this idea of privacy. A camera comes into their house, their life, their yard, not into their house, their yard, and granddaddy destroys the camera. Granny tells a story of a cameraman when someone was going to jump off a bridge. It's not about the jumper. It's about the guy with the camera. And how he would use that to involve himself in another person's life. To take a picture of someone who just died. It's this idea of invasion of privacy. Leave us alone. Now, you guys don't have any concept of this. Because in your Snapstagram world, you take thousands of pictures and you post them everywhere. And you don't care. But you all know their stories. People's pictures get out. You share a photo with somebody, someone screenshots that photo, they email that photo, they, they Twitter that photo, they share that photo, suddenly that photo's gone around the world. It's so easy for hundreds of thousands of people to give likes and thumbs up and share this stuff. You guys, we live in a world with very little privacy. Cameras from the government watching us from every light pole. Is that the world that's really worth living in? And according to Granny and Granddaddy, they don't want to have anything to do with it. You don't need to take photos of us. You don't need to take videos of us. And then I think the other big idea, the other theme here is, that's going on is just because people are poor doesn't mean they don't have basic dignity. Granny, although she's a little bit abrupt with these men, she clearly takes care of her family. She clearly cares about doing things well. She might not have a lot of money, but they want to live like good, reasonable people with dignity. And I love that about Granny. Uh, so those, I think, are some of the big ideas going on in the story. And I think I have definitely exhausted my time limit. So let me kick back over here. Um, make sure I kind of hit everything. Yeah, I think I hit everything. All right, cool. So thanks for paying attention, and uh, we'll catch you again later. Bye-bye.